It is my honor, my privilege to be here. I am very grateful to be invited here to speak to you. Uh, my mother tongue is Bengali, so I won't speak to you in Bangla. I also speak in Hindi. But Sri Gopal Krishnan, after every 10 or 15 minutes, he will translate what I was, uh, what I am saying. Uh, and the subject that I will be talking to you about is looking at crony capitalism in India. And then I'm going to talk a little bit about the impact of crony capitalism, especially on what impact it's had on India's natural resources and how these natural resources, the way they have been allotted, the way they have been priced, these natural resources, it has benefited only a few people. And these resources are meant to be belonging to the people of the country. And after that, I will be talking a little bit about how there is this conspiracy of silence when it comes to big business houses, when it comes to uh, the government, when it comes to the bureaucracy, and a large section of the media too is part of this nexus as a result of which people don't speak out, people are scared to speak out, and therefore I'm very happy that you are here talking about the right to dissent and the right to free speech, which is a fundamental right of every citizen of India. Article 19.1a of the Constitution of India says freedom of expression is a fundamental right of every citizen. Har nagrika ek maulik adhikar. So, we'll talk a little bit about that, but first let me outline this whole issue of crony capitalism. First thing is crony capitalism is not capitalism. Yes, such much puji vaad nahi hai. This is not really capitalism. It is a distorted form of capitalism, which helps a few people, relatives, friends, associates, of those who are in positions of power and authority. Now, capitalism says there should be free enterprise, there should be a free market. But this is not about free enterprise. This is not about a level playing field. This is about how a few people, because of their closeness, their proximity to those who are <coughs> ruling the country, the so-called elected representatives of this, of this country, and it is their proximity That this is not about a free market, this is not about free enterprise, this is not about a level playing field. This is about how a few individuals, big business houses, because of their closeness to those who are ruling our country, that they get to benefit much more than what others do and at the end of the day this is against the interests of ordinary citizens when india became politically independent in 1947 india's first prime minister pandit jawaharlal nehru he wanted india to have a mixed economy mishrit arth vivastha he said that it should take the best of capitalism, it should get the best of socialism and we were supposed to get the best of both worlds, of all worlds. Unfortunately, more than 70 years later, I think there is general consensus that we took the worst of all worlds. Not the best of all worlds, but the worst of all worlds. We took the worst of capitalism and what even socialist countries could do, we could not do. Whether it be former Soviet Union, whether it be Cuba, whether it be Vietnam, it was able to provide health care and education 
to the bulk of its people. We were not able to do that. Kerala is an exception. Kerala is an exception to the rest of India. Because in the rest of India, if you look at the broken state of public health care, when you look at the terrible state of the education system, especially the primary education system, you have realized that we as a country, we have failed the younger generation of this, people, or of this country. Half of India today is below the age of 25. In five or seven years from now, India's population will overtake that of China. We will become the most populous country on this planet. We will have more people in India than in China. But at a time, at a unique moment in Indian history, where half your population is below the age of 25, the state of education in this country is very, very bad. It's pathetic. The state of health care, public health care in India is terrible. As Amartya Sen, the Nobel laureate said, one section of India's population is always in California. But there is one section of India's population and that could be at least one fourth of India's population which is living in conditions which are comparable or even worse than the conditions of people who live in sub-Saharan Africa. This is the India of today. According to the census of 2011, roughly one out of four persons in this country, according to the government of India, could not read or write her or his name. So the point I'm making is, we did not get the best of capitalism, we did not get the best of socialism, we got the worst of all worlds. What was public about our public sector? The public sector was run as if it was the jagirs, the zamindaris, the fierce dumps of some netas and some babus, some political leaders and some important influential bureaucrats. What was private about our private sector? The promoters, the families, the promoters of these companies and these corporate groups, they put a very small proportion of their own money in the form of equity capital. The money would come from government-owned public sector banks and financial institutions. So there was little that was public about our public sector and there was little private about our private sector. In fact, the losses of the public sector often ended up becoming the profits of the private sector. So, it was not a mixed economy, it was a mixed up economy. Indira Gandhi talked about Garibi Hatao. But did it have a significant impact on poverty? It did not. He said, Garibi Hatao, Garib ko hata diya. It was almost like that. So, the point that I want to make and I want to introduce that we haven't seen the best of all worlds. After 1991, the economic, the reforms, economic liberalization, we thought that now the bureaucracy, the politicians, they will have less control over economic activities. Nehru talked about the commanding heights of the economy. Now he said, let us dismantle what Chakravarti Raj Gopal Chari called the license control Raj. They said, let's finish the license control Raj. But what have we seen today? We have seen a few business groups who have done very well. And all of this has something, everything to do with the way politics in this country is funded. How politicians, political parties, and election campaigns, they are funded. This is the root of crony capitalism, the nexus between business and politics. And in this nexus come criminals, they come bureaucrats, and they come media. The media is also a part of this nexus. And that is how we have today a system 
with the government. Mr. Arun Jaitley is talking about electoral bonds. He is saying this will make our system of political funding more transparent. Actually, it is going to do just the opposite. You have to give your money to the state bank. The state bank knows who is giving the money because you have to fulfill the KYC, know your customer norms. Who runs the state bank? Who is the owner of the state bank? Who can control the state bank? Ministry of Finance, Government of India. And now you are saying there is complete transparency. No. We saw the corporate sector in 2014, they spent more money on Mr. Modi and Bharatiya Janata Party's campaign than the Congress. The Congress had been in power for 10 years, but the BJP spends more money than the Congress. And this is not me speaking, this is the official records of the Election Commission of India. So, this is the backdrop against which we see crony capitalism in India. I'm going to talk a little more about the impact that crony capitalism has had on Indian economy and Indian society. I'm now going to give you five, six instances of crony capitalism to highlight how crony capitalism in India has resulted in resources that belong to the people of this country being not just wasted and squandered but looted, looted to benefit a few people. So let me start with the example of the 2G spectrum scam case. Now I was a petitioner in the Supreme Court in this judgment and in February 2012 the Supreme Court of India cancelled about 212 licenses that had been allotted by the government uh, when Mr. A. Raja of the DMK was the minister in charge of communication. He was minister for communications. Now, let's come to the very, very simple issues. What is spectrum? Spectrum is just thin air. You can't see it. It's electromagnetic spectrum. It is just thin air. But it is a very important natural resource because the electromagnetic frequencies are, have to be allotted by the government to different users. It could be the military, it could be a, a, a television company, it could be used for satellites and above all it is used for mobile telecommunications. Today we have had a mobile television, a telecommunications revolution. 14 years ago in 2014, in India there were more television sets than telephone lines. Today, in a country of 1.3 billion people, 130 crore people, there are 100 crore or 1 billion SIM cards, SIMs, subscriber identity modules. That means in most urban areas of India, there are more SIM cards than human beings. There are about 700 million handsets, mobile telephone handsets. And roughly about 300 of them, some would say more than 300 of them, are able to access the internet on that handset. Now, this behind this great telecom revolution, there's been a huge scam, a huge scandal. Now, Spectrum was given in the way cinema tickets are sold. First come, first served. Imagine you are standing in line to watch a, a, a film, a movie, and you are waiting very patiently and your turn has come to buy the tickets. And suddenly from behind you, somebody pulls you out of the line, out of the queue, and says, no, you can't do it, somebody else can. They changed the rules. The cutoff date was suddenly changed. The conditions for granting the letter of intent were suddenly changed. And then the controller and auditor general of India said, this is a huge scam. It is not just India's biggest scandal, 
It is one of the biggest scandals of its kind anywhere in the world. 170,000 crores. 170000 followed by seven more zeros. If you make that into US dollars, it's about 30 billion dollars. Now, they said Mr. Vinod Rai has made up this figure. It is a notional figure. It is a presumptive figure. That means this is the money which could have come to the government, but did not come to the government. But we have subsequently seen in the auctions, huge commitments have been made. But wait, just before the Controller and Auditor General of India put in the papers, uh, uh, Mr. Raja put in his papers just before this Controller and Auditor General's report was made public in Parliament. What was the reason given? It was said, compulsions of coalition politics. Gatbandhan Rajneeti ka majburiya in Hindi nation. What were these compulsions? And who needed whom more? Did Mr. Karunanidhi need Dr. Manmohan Singh more? Or did Dr. Manmohan Singh and Sonia Gandhi need Mr. Karunanidhi more? Why? There were 12 members of parliament supporting the UPA, United Progressive Alliance government. But during this time, when the DMK was in power in Tamil Nadu, there were 34 MLAs belonging to the DMK, uh, sorry, belonging to the Congress that was supporting the DMK government. So 12 MPs in Delhi belonging to the DMK were supporting the Congress-led UPA and in Chennai, there were 34 MLAs belonging to the Congress that were supporting DMK government, Mr. Karunanidhi's government. So both needed each other. After this scandal happened, now, recently, last December, after more than 12 years, the CBI judge says, nobody is guilty. Everybody, all the accused are free. Mr. Raja is not guilty, Ms. Ganimoye is not guilty, the executives who work for Mr. Anil Ambani's companies, they are not guilty, there are 17 accused, all of them. In my opinion, this is a highly flawed judgment. It's a long judgment, runs into over 1500 pages, but I believe this judgment will be overruled when it goes to the higher but it just tells you how long it has taken. I don't think the CBI, the Central Bureau of Investigation, has it done its investigation in a proper manner. There are a lot of flaws. And Mr. O.P. Sani, judge, who has given this judgment, has given it, in my opinion, taken a very narrow and a legalistic view of what I say, the Indian Evidence Act. All right. I'll stop here because this is a very complicated subject, but I believe in the 2G scam, resources that belong to the people of India were not properly allocated, not properly priced. And I believe that today we have a cartel. Earlier we had six or seven mobile operators. Now we have going to have three. There's Reliance Geo. There is going to be idea plus Vodafone and there's going to be Airtel and MTNL and BSNL have been pushed to the margins. Is this good for the consumer? Because today the same telecom operators are also the big media operators. Mr. Mukesh Ambani is a media baron. Mr. Birla Kumar Mangala Birla who heads idea he owns substantial shares in the Living Media Group. So, are we going to see these powerful capitalists deciding what you read, what you hear, and what you watch? I leave this question open. Let's move to the next subject, and after that I'll go back to Mr. Gopal Krishna. And this is Another instance of a scam is Colgate. Coal
blocks. Again, coal is a very important <laughs> mineral. More than half of the electricity that is generated in this country is based on coal. Now, what we see is again the Controller and Auditor General comes in, again the Supreme Court comes in, and they've cancelled all the licenses. But you thought that was the end of the story? But no, the story hasn't ended there. Mr. M. K. Venu is here. He is one of the founding editors of The Wire. The Wire has brought out a report which will tell you there is a new dimension to Colgate. The people were supposed to bid in such a manner that the electricity prices would be the lowest. Yes, but you found that they were passing on very little bit of the benefit to the ordinary users of electricity. And who was getting the coal? Which group has been the biggest beneficiary of the coal allotments that have come from Coal India Limited, which is a public sector undertaking? It's a public sector enterprise which is still producing about 80% of the total coal that is mined and extracted in India. So this allotment which has been given by Coal India Limited a short supply for the next 25 years. The biggest allotment has come gone to the Adani group. Mr. Adani does not like when we tell the, the truth. So many cases have been filed of defamation. Mr. Venu will tell you more about it later. They filed cases against me also. Defamation. We are being accused of defamation. Man honey. But they are not denying the facts. We are stating here are the facts. Where, where have we gone wrong? You don't like our opinion? You don't like our opinion. We have the right to dissent. The constitution gives me, I am a citizen of India. I also have the right to free expression. It's my fundamental right. So I am saying that one scandal is over. A new form of the same scandal is coming, whether it be telecom spectrum or whether it be coal. After this, I will give you three more examples. <laughs> one of gas, natural gas, one of iron ore, and third of land, the Land Acquisition Act. I will tell you what happened in the Krishna Godavari Basin in the Bay of Bengal. This is natural gas that is under the bed of the ocean. Once again, it is a resource that belongs to everybody, every citizen of India, the people of India. It, the Supreme Court has been very clear. This doesn't belong to the government. It belongs to the people. The government has to act in a manner that it is like the guardian, the custodian, the trustee of resources that belong to the people. So they have to ensure that these resources are allotted and priced in a way in which is fair and transparently so that nobody can say that you have favored one group or one company and not benefited the others. What happened in the case of the Krishna Godavari gas? is we had one company which was controlled by Reliance Industries Limited. Reliance Industries Limited is headed by Sri Mukesh Ambani and this is, he is India's richest man. According to different indications, indicators, he is supposed to be the richest man in India. He heads India's biggest privately owned corporate group, which is Reliance Industries Limited. Now, a substantial stake in this company has been taken by a multinational company called British Petroleum, BP. But what happened in the Krishna Godavari gas basin was the two brothers, 
Sri Anil Ambani and Sri Mukesh Ambani had a big fight. After their father passed away without leaving a will, there was a big fight between the two brothers. It was said that, oh, the two wives didn't get along with each other. It was said, Nita ji and Tina ji were not exactly the best of friends. But no, that was not the reason why the brothers fought. In my opinion, and I've written a book on the subject, one of the most important reasons why there was this public fight between the two brothers, the Ambani brothers, was because both of them wanted to control access to natural gas that is coming from the Krishna Godavari Basin in the Bay of Bengal. Anil Ambani's company wanted to set up near Delhi, a place called Dadri, what was supposed to be Asia's biggest and certainly India's biggest gas-based power plant. He was not successful. There was a big dispute with his own elder brother's company. Eventually, what had been promised and what actually was found was a very small fraction. And once again, the controller and auditor general of India came in. Once again, there was a very, very critical report. And finally, what happened was the production sharing contract. There were so many disputes about it. Even now, those disputes are going on. It's in different courts of law. There are arbitration proceedings going on. And what is this dispute all about? There are various disputes about it. One of the disputes is ONGC, Oil and Natural Gas Corporation, and Reliance Industries Limited are having a big fight because ONGC has said Reliance has stolen gas. So this dispute is going on. How much money should be paid to the government that is, there's a dispute going on. First there was Mr. Murli Devra, then there was Mr. Jepal Reddy, then after Mr. Jepal Reddy, there was Sri Vedapa Moili. Ministers changed. There was an attempt made to increase the price of gas. And before Mr. Murli Devra, there was Manishankarayan. So there were four ministers. And there was an attempt made to increase the price of gas from 2.34 dollars per unit to 4.2 dollars, 4.20 dollars per unit. Later on, Sri Manishankar Ayar, after he was no longer the minister, he made a statement in a closed door meeting. He says, everybody in India knows what 420 is all about. You also know what 420 is all about, Charles Obis. At that time, Sri Pranam Mukherjee, he was the head of an empowered group of ministers. They tried to increase the price of gas. Then the elections came in. The election commission did not stop. So, once again, we are seeing these resources don't belong to the Ambani. They don't belong to the Ministry of Petroleum and Natural Gas. They belong to you and me. And not only to you and me, our children and their children. Take the case of what happened in Bellari and Anathpur. I worked on a documentary film series. Mr. Santosh Hegde, he was the Lok Ayukta of Karnataka. He found that the rules had been completely violated. Each and every law had been broken. Which were the companies? The Jindal's companies, Adani's companies, they all broke the law. And this iron ore was, trans uh, was exported to China. Why? Because there was a sudden increase in the demand for iron ore because at that time the Olympic Games in Beijing had started. This was in 2008. And eventually, Gali Janathan Reddy had to be go, go behind bars. Gali Janathan Reddy was a minister. He is a politician. He is also a big business person. And he is also described as a criminal. 
So we see the nexus between business, politics and crime coming together. On the other side of the undivided Andhra Pradesh, there was Y.S. Rajshikar Reddy and his son. After he passed away, Jagan Reddy, he is now the leader of the opposition in Andhra Pradesh. Now we see, Gali Janathan Reddy spends three years in jail. He comes out of jail, he has a lavish wedding party, wedding reception in Bangalore for his daughter. Shri Yadurappa, while he was chief minister, had to go behind bars for a few days. Today he is again the candidate of the Bharatiya Janata Party in the state of Karnataka. But these natural resources, it is called the resource curse, that these resources which Mother Nature has given us, instead of being a blessing, they have become a curse. You look at the map of India, as they say, from the Himalayas to the Bay of Bengal, from Pashupati to Tirupati, from Uttar Pradesh, Bihar, Madhya Pradesh, Jharkhand, Bengal, Orissa, Chhattisgarh, Andhra Pradesh, one-fourth of the land area of India is here. You take the mineral map of India and you take the forest map of India and you juxtapose it, it's like identical. And you put another map there. The map which shows what the Home Ministry called left-wing extremists, Naxalites, Maoists. And you see these three maps are coinciding one after the other. It's called the Red Corridor. The question why are the richest lands, the richest lands of India, which has, which is the most biodiverse parts of India, the richest forests of India, the richest mineral resources of India below the surface of the earth, why are they also home to the poorest people, the Adivasis? The richest lands and the poorest people. Because the benefits of those natural resources have not gone to the people who live there, gone to others who have taken out those resources and made a lot of money, a lot of profits. This is the manifestation of crony capitalism in India. Mr. Modi's government tried to change the Land Acquisition Act. He could not succeed. Attempts were made, one ordinance, another ordinance, another ordinance. He could not change that law. The same story we hear. Because access to land is access to social, economic, political power. And land is a scarce resource in India. Spectrum is scarce, coal is scarce, all the natural resources are scarce. And land is especially scarce in India. India has about 17% of the world's population. But we have only 2.5% of the total land area. So that's why land is so scarce and such an important natural resource. But you see the same story of cronyism and crony capitalism coming over and over again. And this is really one of the biggest sources of corruption in this country. So I'm again going to hand over the microphone to Shri Gopal Krishnan and I will make a few concluding remarks and talk a little bit about attempts being made to silence and the right to free speech and the right to dissent. Just a few words and after that I'll be available for any questions and answers. So this is the last few points I want to make. When I worked on this documentary film on what happened in Bellari and Anandpur, one of the persons who helped me was Gauri Lankesh. I could never imagine what would happen to her. We were shocked. Outside our own home, 
at 8 o'clock or 8.30 in the evening, two people come on a motorcycle and shoot her dead. Now, this is something that has shocked all of us. We may have agree with her, we may not agree with her, whatever it is. No person deserves to die in this manner. She was a journalist. She could have been working for a big English publication or some mainstream media organization. She chose to head a publication that her father had founded. He was a well-known filmmaker, author and journalist. I go back in time. More than 40 years ago, Indira Gandhi imposed the emergency. For the first time in India, the right to free speech was suppressed completely. And some journalists were put behind bars. Many journalists chose to go along with the government. Indira Gandhi's government. In January 1977, Indira Gandhi announced elections. She thought she would win. A few months later, in March 1977, she had lost the elections. L.K. Advani became the information and broadcasting minister. He had been asked a question once while he was minister in Muraji Desai's government. Why did so many journalists bend over, agree to everything that Indira Gandhi said? And he said when they were asked to bend, they crawled. They were just asked to bend their head, but they crawled on the floor. Unfortunately, today we are seeing many senior journalists and heads of media organizations again crawling. They have not even been asked to bend, but they are still crawling. Why? Why do we have this situation? Why do we have today a situation where particular organizations, and I will name them, Times Now, Republic TV, headed by Adnan Goswami, why are they more critical of the opposition rather than the ruling party? This is a question I ask. When they in, first the Prime Minister doesn't give press conferences. When he gives interviews, he gives it to some people. And they only ask him goody goody questions. They don't ask him any questions which are difficult. Now, why has this happened? Why do we today have a situation where even some privately owned media organizations have become so subservient to the government? Are they journalists or are they stenographers? He said, she said. Are they journalists or are they representing an advertising agency? Are they journalists or are they PROs, public relations officers? Today, we live in this day and age of the internet. And there's so much material available on the social media, including fake news. So much of the information that is put out on WhatsApp and other websites is just false. This is not even what you call misinformation. It is what you would call disinformation. That you know the information is false, but nevertheless you are putting it out. The lady before me talked about fascism. This is this was the Hitler's propaganda strategy. This was what Goebbels' strategy was all about. You repeatedly tell a lie over and over again and you think it will become the truth. 
Mr. Modi said he will bring all the black money from abroad. Every family will get 15 lakh rupees, all the poor people, each poor family will get 15 lakh rupees. Then he was asked what happened. Mr. Amit Shah says, no, a chunai jumla. Jumla means it is like an exaggerated claim that was made. Then there was note bandi demonetization in November 2016. Mr. Modi said, black money will go away from this. What happened? Is the black money gone? We know there's Mirav Modi, there's Mehul Choksi. Every other day there is some new scam coming up. And he was saying that there is no black money. And the black money holders have gone got scared because of note bandhi, because of demonetization. You said because of demonetization, all the fake currency notes, the jali notes, the fake currency notes which are being used by the terrorists will be over. That has not happened. You said because of demonetization, there will be cashless society, less cash society. Are we seeing that? Yes, during the period of demonetization, people didn't have a choice. But today, people are back to using cash. Who was it? The farmer, the daily wage laborer, the small shopkeeper, small trader, the senior citizen, the elderly people, and most importantly, women, the women of India. And then you are saying, no bandhi is for the poor, alright? And you want everybody to believe you? This has unfortunately become the discourse today. You raise your voice against the crony capitalists, there will be cases against you. You say, why is India taking such an aggressive position against Pakistan? And you say, no, you are a traitor. You are Desha Drohi. You are a traitor to India. Why are you raising this question? It is like saying, I am questioning Note Bandi, therefore I have black money. It has become black or white. Either you support Mr. Modi, or you become a congressman. You know, this kind of a discourse has become prevalent today. Look at the tensions that have taken place between the two communities in India, the Hindus and the Muslims. Look at what's happening. You say anything about Kashmir and you are anti-Indian. This is what is happening. Mr. Arnab Goswami, my dear friend, every evening he says the nation wants to know. There are 130 crore Indians. Half of the people of India are supposed to be regularly watching television. But they are not all watching news. They are watching entertainment programs. And out of the people who are watching news, a very small proportion is watching English news. And out of the people who are watching English news, an even smaller proportion is watching Republic TV or Times now. But my friend Mr. Goswami says, the nation wants to know. He has become the representative of the nation. This is what populism demagoguery is concerned. You are not looking at facts. You are not looking at logic. You are appealing to people's emotions. So, I take this opportunity to suggest to you, don't be despondent. If we have to come together to fight against these forces of intolerance, these forces that believe that all of us should think along a particular line. I mean, Kerala is a very high... Uh, proportion of its population who are Muslims. One seventh of India, every seven persons of India is a person who is Muslim. 
There are more Muslims in India than in all but two countries in the world, Indonesia and Pakistan. You want to suggest that one-seventh of India has been and is anti-national? No, I don't agree. You want to tell people what they should eat? I don't agree. So, in this day and age where the forces of intolerance are on the rise, we have to come together to fight against them. Kerala, Bengal are unique, no? Both the opposition and the ruling party are both opposed to Mr. Modi. <laughs> Everywhere else in India, uh, uh, it's different. Uh, we'll know what will happen soon in Tripura, in Nagaland, in Meghalaya, in Karnataka. We've seen what has happened in Gujarat. Mr. Amit Shah said, any seat, any, anything less than 150 is a defeat for the Bharti Janta Party. They had 115, they got 99. It was a very close contest. In Rajasthan, we've seen the results of the by-elections, two Lok Sabha constituencies, one Han Sabha constituency. But the next one year and a few months, next 15 months will be very crucial. I don't know what will happen. Will there be a Ram Mandir in Ayodhya? Question mark. Triple Talaq? Question mark. War with Pakistan? Question mark. I don't know. In 2014, the Bharti Janta Party got 31.4% of the vote. They got 282 seats. But, but look at the map of India. In roughly 60%, roughly 60% of the Lok Sabha constituencies in India, the Bharti Janta Party got 90% of the vote. But in the remaining 40% of the Lok Sabha constituencies, they got just a little over 20% of the vote. I'm giving you facts. In 2014, the BJP and the Congress put together got half the vote. But it was made out as if this is an American-style presidential election. Trump versus Hillary Clinton. Here it became Modi versus Rahul Gandhi. India is a multi-party democracy. So, the time ahead is filled with uncertainties and filled with possibilities. So I believe that all of us who believe in secularism, who believe in progress, should come together to fight against the forces of intolerance. I thank you once again for giving me this opportunity to speak with you.